Hi everybody, welcome back to GG497 Geological Visualization. Today we're going to recap on what we know about structural contours so far and then we're going to look at how we can make more um, complex structural contour maps and how we can interpret them and this lecture will really help us as we go into our next two topics where we'll look at faults and unconformities. Okay, so to start our recap then, when we introduced structural contours, we introduced them using this block diagram and we asked ourselves to imagine this contact, this plane of contact between units A and B. And you can see that block diagram and you can see its cross sections on two sides and hopefully you can convince yourselves that that contact is inclined. It looks like the contact between A and B is dipping towards us. Okay and because this has got this is a dipping contact we can make the realization that because it's dipping and it's not horizontal the height of the contact is not constant it will change. So, for example, if we were sat on our contact, if we lifted off that top unit A and we sat on the contact here, we'd be higher up, we'd be at a higher elevation than if we were to slide down this contact and end up here. So, because the elevation across this plane changes, maybe what we can do is draw lines across that plane that link points of equal height or equal elevation. So anywhere that we were sat along the plane along, the, along this line, we'd be at 160 meters above sea level. And anywhere that we were on this line, as we walked across this line, we'd remain at a constant elevation of 140, 130, 120, and so on. And it's these lines that show the height of a structure, whether it's a bedding plane, a fault plane, or an unconformity, or, or whatever else. We call these lines structural contours. And they just show you the height of a certain feature. In one of our examples, we showed how we could use the intersection between a geological contact between two different units and the ground contours. We showed how we could use the intersection between that contact and that topography to draw structural contours. We also showed how if we have a structural contour map and we underlie it or merge it with a topographic, topographic map, we can show that anywhere where the height of the structural contour and the height of the ground is equal, that's where our structure would crop out on the surface. So we showed how we could start with a structural contour map, add it to a topographic map, and then come up with a geological map. Okay, so we we decided that these were really useful because if we had a structure contour map for a boundary, we could use it to predict where a contact would crop out and we could even use it to build a geological map for areas where we have uh, limited exposure, like where would the rocks be beneath the vegetation which we can't map through. But these structural maps that we've used have, um, we've, we've been able to work them because we've had a few data points. We've had at, at least two locations where we could draw a structural contour line through. But what about the instances where we have more limited data. So let's have a look at this example where all we have is one dip measurement and we only have one location where our feature, our contact between rock unit A and rock unit B crops out at a point where it intersects a topographic contour what would we do about preparing a structural contour map for this limited level of data? Well, maybe what we could do is find that one place 
where we have that contact and we know at that point the height of the feature is at 120 meters it's crossing the 120 meter topographic contour so at that point at that intersection the height of our contact must also be 120 meters now what do we remember about structural contours and strike well the strike of a bed or a contact is the horizontal line that you can draw across that inclined surface so if our strike is a horizontal line and a structure contour contour joins points of equal height you can see that the two will be parallel so our 120 meter contour structural contour will be a straight line that's parallel to strike and go through that intersection with the topographic contour but that's just one structural contour right so what would we do if we wanted to draw the 120 meter uh, the 110 meter structural contour where could we place that Well, if we think about it in um, cross section, this is this is kind of the situation we've got. If we were to draw a cross section through our map, this is what we'd have. We've got a topography, and at this, along this cross section line, we know that the height of the ground is greater than 120, but the height of the structure is 120. So we'd be stood here on a cross section. We'd be on the height of the ground greater than 120, but our um, contact itself would be at 120 meters so we can see that if we were to expand this cross section to show where the 110 meter structural cross section structural contour would be we would see that we would travel down dip a certain amount until we reach 120 me 110 meters elevation and it's at that point, if we were to project it up to the map surface, that would be our position for the 110 meter structural contour. Okay? Now that, once we get this second structural contour drawn, that's fantastic because then we'll have defined what our contour spacing is. And then if we wanted to draw the 100 meter structural contour, the 90 meter structural contour and so on, we'd be able to do that no sweat because we've worked out what our contour spacing would be so the way that we would calculate that contour spacing that interval between our structural contours would be equal to the size of the spacing so what distance do we want to draw our, our structural contours and we want to draw every 10 meters so our co structural contour spacing would be equal to 10 meters divided by the tan of the dip of the bed. So the dip of the, our bed is 32. So we take that 10 meters, that's the desired interval we want to take for our structural contours, and we divide it by the tan of the dip, tan of 32. okay so that's how that's our calculation and once we had done that contour spacing calculation then we could work out what the distance on the map would be between our contour spacing okay so that's how we would do it if we had one dip and one structural contour one place that we knew the height of the structure But what about if instead we just had three points of data? We didn't have an angle. We don't know the dip. We just have three depths that we found to the same structure from three different places. Okay, so imagine that we've got a surface. This is our map. And we have a surface beneath this map that's dipping. And we are, we're trying to figure out what the angle of dip and the direction of dip of that surface is and all we've got to go on is 
we've drilled at this location and we had to drill to a depth of 100 meters to find the structure here we've depth we've drilled at 130 meters and here we've drilled and had to go down 80 meters okay so we have these three data points And just based on those data points, I want you to think about how you might start figuring out how you could draw your structural contours. Are they going to go in this direction? Are they going to go in this direction? Or are they going to go in some other direction? How do you think that you might find um, how to plot those structural contours? So far, we've had structural contours that we can join between points of equal height but all three of our heights are different okay well if you think about it this way if the if the depth down to our contact is 80 meters here and it's 100 meters here then between them there's going to be there's going to exist a gradient isn't there if we were to walk from this point on our surface up to this point sooner or later we're going to cross the 90 aren't we so what we can start doing is drawing tie lines between our different our three data points and figure out or interpolate where the other contour the key contour heights would be so for example if we took a tie line between this point here at 80 and this point here at 100 then halfway between them because this is a uniformly dipping surface halfway between these two points we're going to hit the 90 yep so if we looked at that block diagram in map view this is where it would be this is our tie line between our two heights um, of, of known depths of the contact and this is where our interpolated 90 would be then what we can do is draw a tie line between the two other points and work out if we if we're assuming a uniform gradient where the 120 110 100 and 90 would be and then we could finish our triangle by drawing another tie line between the 130 and 100 and assuming this is a uniformly dipping surface this is where I'd be our 120 would be a third of the distance away our 110 would be two-thirds of the distance away and then that would give us our gradient along the slope between those two tie lines okay great now what we've been able to do is figure out more points where we know or can be pretty certain where the height of that contact is so for instance now what we can do is link the 100 depths the one that we've drilled directly and the one that we've interpreted that gives us our 100 meter structural contour then we can do the same for our 90 between the two points that we've interpreted and then we can fill in the structure the rest of the structural contours for all of the other heights because we know that our structural contours for uniformly dipping surfaces they'll be equally spaced and they'll be parallel okay so that's all the kind of different ways that you might run into structural contours for planar uniformly dipping surfaces and that's all of the ways that you could feasibly make a structural contour map but what about structural contours for curved surfaces so far we've we've made the assumption that all of our planes that we're going to we're going to ever draw in this way that they are perfectly um, planar they're, they're flat they're uniformly dipping however 
in reality, contacts are often curved. So you can imagine that if you were to draw um, structural contours over this, over this surface, here the contours would be really close together because it's so steep. But here the contours would be really, 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 really far apart because there's a really low angle dip going on. Okay, so they wouldn't be uniformly spaced. And if we were to contour this surface, you can see how it would probably curve across the landscape. Okay, so when we have a contact that's curved, as is often the case, not always, but it, but often it can be, how would we draw their structural contours? Well, let's say that we have four boreholes. So we've got four drills that have um, drilled down uh, to show the height of a contact. So we're, we're on some sort of ground surface, we've drilled down and we've figured out that the height of the contact at this point is 100, here it's 150, here it's 150 and here it is at 200. Well, what we could do is similar to the last example we could find an interval between two of the boreholes which then we could join up. So for example between the 100 height and the 200 height we know that sooner or later as we, would, as we travel along the plane from 200 to 100 we're going to hit the 150 aren't we? So if we were to assume that that 150 is halfway between the 100 and 200. If we assume that that gradient is constant across that tie line between the two points, then we'd cross it 150 at about halfway across, wouldn't we? So then maybe what we could do is join our 150s. But if we try to do that with a straight line, you can see that it doesn't work, does it? So if we were at 150 here and we tried to get to our 150 uh, on our tie line and then get to our 150 at our second borehole, you can see that we can't just do it with a simple straight line. So instead of relying on a simple straight line to join our points of known height, known and equal height, we have to instead curve our line. Okay, and this is the case for, this is the sort of structural contour that you'd expect to see for a curved surface. Instead of being linear and straight, cur uh, f which, you, which is the sort of structural contour you'd expect for a uniformly dipping planar surface, if that surface is instead curved, then so too will your structural contours curve. Okay, so you can imagine that these are the, our two um, our, our two examples, our two end members. This is an example where the plane is perfectly uniform and constantly dipping. So you can imagine that if we were to look at these structural contours on map surface, they'd just be a series of straight and parallel equally spaced lines on our map. But you can imagine if our surface is instead curved, when we look at these structural contours produced on the map surface, those structural contours will also be curved. And that's because the, the curvature means that the dip and the dip direction of different parts of the of the curved surface will, will vary. So this is an example of uh, what you might, if you were to draw a structural contour map that ended up like this, this is an example of where um, the structural contours are telling you that your surface is, is curved. And for example, over here, the tightness and the closeness of the contours means 
that the rocks are dipping uh, towards the north steeply like it's a, it's it's steep because the um, structural contours mean that there's a great change in vertical height over a not very great horizontal distance but over in this location you can see how the structural contours have curved so now the rocks are dipping towards the northwest and at a much lower angle there they've got a much more gentle dip and you can tell that because the structural contours are so widely spaced okay so those are structural contour maps done and dusted we've we've had a look at ones where they're they're uniformly dipping and we've seen ones where they are curved so now we can move on to thinking about this concept um, apparent dip versus true dip for dipping surfaces we've come across this a couple of times in the cross sections but I want to make sure that we um, are clear about what apparent dip means and its relationship to true dip. Okay, well imagine we've got a dipping bed that we're going to draw in block diagram. And we've got these two cross sections which have been cut one of them perpendicular to strike so the strike of our beds is running in this direction and our cross section is perpendicular to that and we've got another one which is parallel to strike so we've got this cross section here at parallel to strike and we've got this cross section perpendicular to strike now hopefully you can see that when we take that cross section perpendicular to strike the dip that we see in cross section is the maximum it can be it's the steepest it can be it's the true dip it's a true reflection of the dip of the bed itself so whatever angle we measure with our compasses and our clinometers in the field whatever dip angle we measure that's going to be the angle we see on this cross section that's been taken perpendicular to strike However, if we were to cut another cross section into our block diagram, let's say that this one we've taken uh, obliquely to strike. You can see that this one is perpendicular to strike and this one is at like a funny angle to strike. You can see that the dip of the bed that we now have drawn in cross section, it's at a much lower angle than when we had the cross section taken perpendicular to strike okay and you can see that that apparent dip is a lot lower than the true dip so whenever we take a cross section that isn't exactly perpendicular to strike when we look at the rocks in that cross section that, that's at this funny angle to strike then we're going to see an apparent dip which is always always less than the true dip Okay, so to see that in um, in map view, this is if we were looking straight down at that block diagram, this is what we'd see. Our di our rocks are striking north south, and they're dipping at 45 degrees. Our section line is perpendicular to strike, and it's under that um, example that we'll see a true dip. So if we were to take a cross section along section AB, the dip of that bed in cross section would be 45 degrees but instead if we were to take a cross section that's not quite perpendicular to strike there's some angle between the strike of the beds and the cross section we'll see some sort of apparent dip which will be a lot lower or it'll be lower anyway than the true dip okay so how do we work out what angle we would draw these contacts at um, given that we've got this this funny um, angle between the strike and the cross section well there's two ways that we can do it 
One of them is through trigonometry and the other one is through an alignment diagram. So if you're not happy with the maths and not happy with trig, that's okay. People have realized that and they've made diagrams which allow you to convert it without having to do any maths. So the first method is trigonometry and the equation which I'd probably write down is that the tan of the apparent dip is equal to the tan of the true dip multiplied by cos alpha and cos alpha is the angle between the cross-section line and the direction of dip. Okay, so you can see that our beds are dipping at 45 degrees to the east. And we've drawn our cross-section line so it runs northeast, southwest. And so we t measure the, the angle using a protractor or a compass between them. And then this would give you that angle alpha. Okay, so for example, let's, let's work it out for our um, diagram. The, the true dip of our beds is 45, so we take the tan of 45, we multiply it to give us the cos, uh, we multiply it by the cos of 37, which is the angle between our section orientation and our dip direction. When we do that, tan 45 becomes 1, the cos of 37 becomes 0.799. So we simplify that down to give us the tan of our apparent dip. Then to turn this into an apparent dip rather than a tangent, we take the inverse tangent of that number and it shows that the dip of our beds, if we were to draw a cross section along x, y at this angle relative to strike, the, the dip that we'd see on our cross section would be 39. So by changing the orientation of the cross-section line from being perpendicular to being oblique, we've lost six degrees worth of, of true dip. We've shallowed that bed by, by six degrees, apparently, by taking this slightly funny angle in our cross-section. Okay, if we didn't want to do trig, then there are these cool diagrams which allow you to align um, and, and solve your apparent dip um, graphically. All you need to know is the true dip of the beds and the angle between the strike of the beds and the section line. So, for example, if we went back to our our example, the true dip of our beds is 45 and the angle between strike and our cross section line is 53. So we find 45 on this part of the diagram, we leave a mark there and we find 53 on our angle of projection which is here and we join the two up and you can see that where that that join, where that tie line between those two knowns hits this projected dip part of the diagram, that'll tell us what angle we need to draw our apparent dip on our cross section. Okay, so this intersection gives us our apparent dip and the one that we should draw on our on our cross section line. So that's, that's kind of where I want to leave it. We've covered the apparent dip and how we calculate it and what it means and why it's important. We've refreshed ourselves about structural contours and we figured out a little bit about how we might draw them for curved surfaces and how curved surfaces would look on structural contour maps. So now, once we know this, we'll be able to draw structural contour maps for the folds, uh, for the unconformities and the faults that we'll see in the next couple of labs and figure out how we can draw them on cross-section 
taking into account the angle of cross-section that we're going to draw. Okay, so now you guys can crack on with the lab and I'll see you there for the next video in a few minutes. Thanks, bye-bye.